بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته طيب we move on to the next chapter the imam he says باب نواقض الوضوء باب نواقض الوضوء have I pronounced that correctly أحسنت وضوء right why not وضوء وضوء is the thing we make وضوء from وضوء is the action right so باب نواقض الوضوء نواقض means those things which break okay uh, break the wudu, also known as mufsadat al wudu, those things which spoil the wudu. Okay, so here he's going to talk about the factors which spoil the wudu. The Imam he says, Wahiya sab'atun, and they are seven. Okay, seven of them you need to memorize. Al kharijun min sabilain ala kulli hal, that which comes out of the two private parts in every case. The two private parts, meaning the front and the back. Okay, the male and female. Anything which comes out of the private parts in all situations will break your wudu. So whether that which comes out of your private part is a najas, impure or pure. Impure like the answer in the call to nature. What comes out which is pure? Money for example, ahsant, very good. Okay, what else? Wind, if you pass wind, right? This is pure, but in the sense that it's not najas, but it breaks your wudu. So anything which comes out from those parts requires uh, wudu, whether small or large amounts, okay? And of course, if it comes out and it has body, if it has body to it, then you require to make istinja after that. But if it's just wind, wind doesn't require you to make istinja. But urine and anything else which has some form of body that comes out the private parts requires you to make either istijmar or istinja depending upon the situation. The proofs for these are many. Allah says in Sultan Nisa, if talking about the purification, if one of you comes from the place of ghaid, the place of relieving yourself, then he has to go on and purify himself. The Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, لا يقبل الله صلاة أحدكم إذا أحدث حتى يتوضع That Allah does not accept the prayer of one of you if he makes hadith until he makes wudu. Okay? And Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu was asked what is hadith and he said it's the passing of wind. طيب, the Imam he says, وَالْخَارِجُ النَّجَسْ مِنْ غَيْرِهِمَا إِذَا فَحُشْ And also, any najasa which comes out of the body other from the two private parts. Okay, with the conditions that it's fahush. Fahush, we said before, it's a shocking amount. It's a large amount to the individual that when he looks at it, he's kind of taken aback. So the Imam here is saying that any amount which comes out from other than the sabilain, other than the two private parts, any najasa that comes out from the body will break your wudu. Now, if it's that najasa which is urine or feces, then even if it's a tiny amount, that will break your wudu. It doesn't have to be a shocking amount, even if it's a tiny amount, okay? The Hanbali scholars, they say even a tiny amount will break your wudu. But other parts which come out like blood or pus or vomit or anything of that nature comes out from your body, La Allah, may Allah not make that the case, then it breaks your wudu. Now if a person, he has a situation where he has a medical situation, he has to have a bag of some sort attached to him, and blood is pouring into that bag continually, or pus, or feces, or anything of that sort, but it's not from the normal parts, right? It's from a part of his body. This person is given the ruling of man bihi salas al-bawl. Salas al-bawl is a fiqhi ruling, where the person's urine doesn't stop, it continues to drop. So the person who's in that situation, he has a bag attached to his body, la samahallah, and najasa keeps coming out. His ruling is the ruling of the one who has salas al bawl which means that the person cannot make wudu until the time for salah has come in. He can only make wudu at that time when he's about to pray. So he makes one wudu and that suffices him, even though his najasa is continually coming out. Okay, that's his situation. Tayyip. The Imam he says, وَزْوَالُ الْعَقَلْ إِلَّا النَّوْمُ يُسِيرُ جَالِسًا أَوْ قَائِمًا And the removing of one's aql, everybody knows aql, right? One's aql, except for the norm which is yasir, except for which is light sleep, whilst the person is sitting or standing. So the removing of your uh, faculty, your intellectual faculty, uh, breaks the wudu. And any form of, uh, and the, Forms of sleep also break your wudu unless it's light. So the proof that the sleep breaks your wudu is in the hadith that we took before last session. In Imam Tirmidhi narrates the hadith of Safwan ibn Asal, 
where he said the Prophet ﷺ used to command us if we were traveling not to remove our socks for three days and three nights, illa min janabatin, except that we remove it if we are in a state of janaba. But then he said, walakin min ghait aw bawlin aw nawm. But you don't have to remove it if you have the situation of ghait, uh, which is feces, uh, urine, or sleeping. So he mentioned these three things which break the wudu. He said, you do not have to remove your sock in those situations. So the hadith is a proof that sleep breaks your wudu, okay? Sleep breaks your wudu. So if you're sleeping, the, the heavy sleep, okay, whereby everyone knows they're asleep, this breaks the wudu based upon the hadith which I mentioned. If it's a light sleep, then this doesn't break your wudu. And the evidence for that is the narration of Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu, where he said in Sahih Muslim, كان أصحاب رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ينتظر ينتظر صلاة العشاء حتى تخفق رؤوسهم ثم يصلون ولا يتوضؤون. That the companions of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم narrated by Anas in Sahih Muslim that they used to wait for Isha prayer and you know the Prophet used to love to delay the prayer. They would wait to the extent that their heads would go back and forth from being tired and from falling into a type of sleep. Then they would get up and pray and they wouldn't make wudu. They wouldn't make wudu. So somebody may read this and say, well, here it says you don't have to make wudu whilst you're sleeping. But no, as you can see, this is light sleep. It's the sleep where the person is sitting on his buttocks or he's standing and he's just basically rocking back and forth. So the light sleep doesn't break your wudu if it's sitting or standing. Anything else I need to add to this sitting and standing? For the sitting and standing, I mean. Is there another condition I need to add for sitting and standing? What about not leaning against something because you can sit like some people do lean against the pillars and they have a very nice sleep in my lesson right you can lean against something and you can have a very nice sleep so that's not considered okay it's sitting or standing without leaning against something okay that sleep is excused what does one do if he slept but he wasn't sure was it the deep sleep or the light sleep what's his situation he goes to that which he had yaqeen upon he goes back to the rule al 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 al, al, al yaqeen Al-shaq la yazul al yaqeen Okay, doubt doesn't remove certainty. So you go back to the thing that you knew for sure. Okay, which was that before you went asleep and this may have just been light sleep. For the one who has lost his consciousness uh, due to being unconscious or he had to take some kind of medication for an operation and he was unconscious, the Hanbali scholars say that any form of unconsciousness, those prayers you have to make up. Any prayer, no matter how many you miss. The Maliki and Shafi scholars, they say no prayers have to be made up in the state of being unconscious. Okay? Imam Abu Hanifa and the Hanafi scholars, may Allah have mercy upon them, they say if these prayers were five or less, then you make them up. But five and more, you do not make them up. This is for the one who was unconscious. Okay? So the Hanbali say, all scholars, uh, Maliki and Shafi say, none have to be made up. Abu Hanifa and his companions, they say, Rahimumullah, that if five or less, they need to be made up. طيب, if the person oversleeps a prayer or he forgets a prayer, what does he do in that situation? As soon as he wakes or he remembers, he prays the prayer, right? Because in the hadith in Sahih Muslim, إِذَا نَامَ أَحَدُكُمْ عَنِ الصَّلَاءَ أَوْ نَصِيَهَا فَكَفَارَتُهَا أَنْ يُصَلِّهَا إِذَا ذَكَرَهَا If one of you sleeps over a prayer or misses a prayer, then the expiation for that is to pray it as soon as he wakes up or he remembers the prayer. Okay, so in the state of forgetfulness or sleep, the way you make up the prayers as soon as you wake or as soon as you remember. طيب. The Imam, he says, وَزَوَالُ الْعَقَلْ إِلَّا النَّوْمْ يَصِيرْ جَالِسًا أَوْ قَائِمًا Okay, we mentioned that. He goes on and he says the third one is وَلَّمْسُ الذَّكَرْ بِيَدِهِ And to touch your private part with your hand breaks your wudu. Whether that's the man touching his private part or the woman touching his private part, her private part. Okay, front and back. Sorry to have to go into details. Okay, don't mean to embarrass anybody, but the back hair they're referring not to the buttocks, they're referring to the actual place where you relieve yourself from, okay? If that is touched. If one was to touch his buttocks, then that doesn't break his wudu. And with regards to the private part of the front, touching the groin also doesn't break the wudu. It's just the actual private part itself which one uses to relieve, okay? So if that is touched by the man or the woman, either the front or the back, that breaks the wudu. And the proof of that is the hadith of Busra. Bint Safwan radiallahu anhu in uh, radiallahu anha in uh, Abi Dawood and Tirmidhi the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said man masa dhakrahu man masa dhakrahu falyatawadda whoever touches his private part then let him make wudu 
Okay? So according to this hadith, the majority of the ulama and our imam, they said that the one who touches his private part, his wudu breaks. They say, not only is the hadith clearly telling you that, they say also when one touches their private part, something may have aroused after that, and it may come out without them realizing, okay? So there's a rule in fiqh, which is, مَا كَانَ مَذَنَّةَ الْحَدِثْ أُلِّقَ الْحُكْمْ بِهِ مَا كَانَ مَذَنَّةَ الْحَدِثْ أُلِّقَ الْحُكْمْ بِهِ That which is the likelihood for breaking wudu, then the ruling is attached to that. So for example, sleep in of itself, how does that break wudu? We mentioned just before sleep, right? But sleep is madhannat al-hadith. It's the likelihood of breaking wudu. That when you're asleep, it could be very likely that you broke your wudu by passing wind and you didn't know. Likewise, hair, touching your private part, it could be very likely that due to that touching, something is excreted. So that's why they say this rule, tayyib. So the majority, they said, based upon this hadith and this rule, that uh, touching yourself breaks your wudu. Okay? Another group of ulama, like Imam Abu Hanifa, and Imam Ibn Taymiyyah, they said no. They said because we have the hadith collected by Imam Ahmad and Imam Nisa'i, the hadith of Talq ibn Habib. Talq, Talq ibn Habib, he said that a man asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya Rasulullah, ma tara fi rajulin masa dhakrahu fi salah. O Prophet of Allah, what do you think of, of a man who touches his private part while he's in the prayer? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Hal huwa illa bad'atun mink. Is it not except a part of you? The Prophet said, وسلم, said, is it not except a part of you? Meaning that there's no wudu required, right? It's just a part of you. But many of the hadith specialists, they say that this hadith is weak. Okay? Imam Ibn Hajj al-Asqalani, for example. Imam al-Nawi, Imam al-Bayhaq, Imam al-Hatim. They say that this hadith is weak. All of these are specialists, right? Others, they say the hadith is mansukh, mansukh repealed by the hadith of uh, Busra that we mentioned, right? So we have the hadith of Busra. And we had the hadith of Talq ibn Habib. Now, in reply to this hadith of Talq ibn Habib, even if you consider it to be authentic, the Hanbali scholars, they say, look, what was the question? The question was about a person in the prayer. Now, a person in the prayer, when he touches his private part, he's going to have a barrier. He's going to have clothing between him and the private part. So the hadith doesn't hold as a proof in this situation against our hadith that we're mentioning, okay? So this is one of the things that they mentioned. Many of the ulama, the majority in fact, they say that touching even the, um, the aura of the, pri of, the, um, of the child breaks the person's wudu, okay? It will break the wudu. And when we mean touching breaks wudu, it's the one who's doing the touching. His wudu is broken, not the one who's being touched. So if a, if a partner is touching his partner, then depending who's doing the touching, the partner's wudu is not broken. It's the one who's doing the touching. The one who's doing the touching, their wudu is broken, not the one who's being touched, okay? Taib, the Imam, he says next, وَلَمْسُ إِمْرَأَةٍ لِشَهْوَةٍ And to touch a woman, لِشَهْوَةٍ To touch a woman with desire, okay? If you touch a woman with desire, this breaks wudu because in Surah Al-Nisa, وَإِن كُنْتُمْ مَرْضَى أَوْ جَاءَ أَحَدُكُمْ مِنَ الْغَائِتِ أَوْ لَا مَسْتُمُ النِّسَاءِ This word in the verse in Surah Al-Nisa, أَوْ لَا مَسْتُمُ النِّسَاءِ one of its meanings is touch. Lumps is to touch, right? And Ibn Masudin radiallahu anhu, the great mufassir of the Quran, the companion, is narrated that he said lumps here means to touch with desire. So that if you touch the woman with desire, this is the opinion of the majority, any part of the woman with any part of your body, then this breaks the wudu of the person who is touching, not the one who is being touched, right? Other scholars like Imam Abu Hanifa and Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala, they said it doesn't break with desire. Any form of touching doesn't break, whether it's with, with desire or without desire. The, the verse is referring to what, because Ibn Abbas in radiallahu anhu, he mentioned that the verse is referring to intercourse. The verse is referring to intercourse. If marital relationships take place, this is what the verse is referring to. This is where the wudu breaks, okay? Not just by touching. And one of the proofs they have for this opinion that touching a woman with desire or without desire doesn't break wudu is the hadith where collected by Abi Dawood in Tirmidhi, where our mother Aisha radiyallahu anha, she mentioned, قَبَّلَ أَنَّ النَّبِي صَلَى اللَّهِ وَسَلَّمْ إِمْرَأَةً مِنْ نِسَائِهِ ثُمَّ خَرَجَ إِلَى صَلَاءِ وَلَمْ يَتَوَضَّعُ That Aisha radiyallahu anha, she mentions that the Prophet صلى الله kissed one of his women, one of his wives, and then he went out to salah and he didn't make wudu. So where's the proof? That the Prophet صلى الله عليه did an action of kissing, right? And he went out to the salah and he didn't make wudu. 
Other scholars, they say no, because in another narration, Aisha radiallahu anha herself, he, she said, وَلَكِنَّهُ أَمْلَكَكُمْ لِإِرْبِهِ But he was the most able to control his desires. So it's those Aisha radiallahu anha is saying this applies only to the Prophet ﷺ. In any case, what did our Imam say? Our Imam said that touching the woman with desire breaks the wudu, right? The next point that the Imam he mentions, وَالْرِدَّةُ عَنِ الْإِسْلَامِ And to make ridda an islam, na'udhu billah min dhalik. May Allah Azza protect us from that. Ridda is that you fall into kufr, you fall into disbelief, whether through action or whether through a belief, which takes you out of the fold of Islam. Because there are a set of beliefs and there are a set of actions that if you were to do them, they can take you out of the fold of Islam. Why is can an important word? Because it doesn't mean that just because you see somebody doing an action of kufr or a statement of kufr that this person has now left the fold of Islam. No. Because did the person understand what they were saying? Did they know, have knowledge that this action or this statement would take them out of the fold of Islam? Was the person in a right state of mind? Was the person confused with evidences that made him think that it was allowed to say that or to do that? Was the person compelled? So there are all these mawani'a which need to be removed before the ruling is given that a person has actually fallen into takfir. Okay? So when we mention ridda and these things, don't think that, yeah, it's easy. That as soon as somebody says a statement of kufr or does an action of kufr, that means they're out of the fold of Islam. It doesn't work like that. But these issues are very serious and they should make the hair on somebody's neck stand up that if you were to see kufr, whether in statement or action, you should have a panic attack, right? So we need to go back to the books of Aqidah to learn what are these things which can break one's iman and cause somebody to fall into ridda. May Allah Azawajal protect us from that. So the imam, he says, to fall into ridda also breaks your uh, wudu, okay? Ridda from the fall of Islam. Why? Because in Surah Zumar, Allah Azawajal says, لَقَدْ أُوْهِيَ إِلَيْكَ وَإِلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكَ لَإِنْ أَشْرَكْتَ لَيَحْبَطَنَّ عَمَلَكَ وَلَا تَكُونَنَّ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ In Surah Zumar, Allah Azawajal said, it has been revealed to you, O Muhammad, and those before you, that if you associate partners with Allah Azawajal, then you will have destroyed all of your actions, and you will be from those who are the losers. So how is this a proof then that ridda invalidates wudu? Yeah, so losing your Islam, losing your Iman means you lose your deeds because deeds are pegged upon Iman. So this verse is saying that if you make shirk, then all of your deeds will be destroyed. So if you lose your Iman, then you lose your deeds, which is wudu, right? This is what they are saying from this verse. Imam Abu Hanifa and Imam Shafi, they say no. So our Imam said what? He said, ridda breaks your wudu. Imam Abu Hanifa and Imam Shafi, they say no. They say, look at the verse in Surah Al-Baqarah. Where Allah Azawajal says, وَمَنْ يَرْتَدِدْ مِنْكُمْ عَنْ دِينِهِ فَيَمُتْ وَهُوَ كَافِرٌ فَأُولَٰئِكَ حَبِطَتْ أَعْمَالُهُمْ فِي الدُّنْيَ وَالْآخِرَةِ وَأُولَٰئِكَ أَصْحَابُ النَّارِ هُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ So here in this verse, in Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah Azawajal says, whoever, we, whoever turns away from the religion, makes ridda of the religion, okay, of the religion, and dies, and he is in a state of kufr, then that is the person who destroys all of his deeds. So in this verse, it's different to the previous verse because it's saying it's pegged upon death. That if you die in a state of kufr, then that is when your deeds become invalid. Our Imam and those who agree with him, they said no, it's just falling to ridda itself. The others, Abu Hanifa, etc., they said based upon the verse in Surah Al-Baqarah, it's the one who falls into ridda and dies upon ridda. Okay? In any case, ridda breaks the actions and breaks the wudu. The last thing that we need to mention is the Imam, he says, وَأَكِلْ لَحْمَ الْجُزُورِ And to eat the uh, flesh of the camels, okay? To eat camel meat. This is known from Mufradat Al-Hanabila. Mufradat Al-Hanabila means that it's only the humble scholars that mention this, okay? Uh, none of the other madhahib, they mentioned this. In any case, they have the evidence in Sahih Muslim, narrated by Jabir radiyallahu anhu, where the Prophet sallallahu was asked, Ya Rasulullah, anna tawadda'a min lahum min ibl? Qal naam, tawadda'u minha. The Prophet sallallahu was asked, O oh, Prophet of Allah, should we make wudu from the flesh of the camels? He said, yes, make wudu from the flesh of the camels. He was asked in the same breath, anna tawadda'a min lahum min ghanam? Qal in shi'at. He was asked, should we make uh, wudu from eating lamb, etc.? The Prophet ﷺ said, if you wish to do so, then make wudu. And if you do not wish to do so, then do not make wudu. So where's the proof here that eating camel's meat breaks your wudu? 
In the first instance, the Prophet ﷺ was asked about camel meat and he said definitely, yes, make wudu from it. In the other, the other case of eating lamb meat, etc., he said it's up to you, go ahead. They were given the choice, okay? So eating camel meat breaks your wudu. What about drinking camel milk? It doesn't break your wudu unless it's the first time you've tasted it. <laughs> if it's the first time you've tasted it, you're in trouble. Camel milk, right? But yes, you're right, absolutely. So drinking from the camel milk, uh, soup, etc., these kind of things doesn't break your wudu. The thing that breaks your wudu is the flesh of the camel. The flesh of the camel, okay, is what breaks your wudu. So if you were to chew on skin, for example, camel skin, that wouldn't break your wudu, okay? You were to chew on the bones or something of that nature, it doesn't break your wudu, it's just the meat itself. So this is the opinion of our imam and the Hanbali scholars. The others, the majority, they said no. They said no, it doesn't break your wudu because you have the hadith in Abu Dawood with the Prophet where it said, Akhul Amrain min Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, Tarkul wudu mimma masat al nar. The last of the two um, rulings from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, one of the last of the two rulings from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam was to leave alone wudu, to not have to make wudu from that which touches fire, meaning that which you cook with the fire, different types of meat, right? So they said here, it's a clear proof that you do not have to make wudu from camel meat. Can anybody see a refutation, a way to, re to reply to this hadith? And to, and to support what the Hanbali scholars are saying. Very good, Ahsan, may Allah open up for you, Ameen. This is the, the hadith which I just mentioned now is Am. Okay, Am means it's general, it's in, encompassing all types of meat. Okay, the first hadith of Jabir in Sahih Muslim is khas, specifically relating to camel meat. Well, khas yukhassisul al -mum. The khas specifies or restricts umum, generality. So when you have a general narration like the one I just mentioned, okay, and you have a specific narration, the one which came before, the specific specifies the general narration. Okay, so in any case, the specific uh, narration takes place according to Imam and the Hanbali, Hanbali scholars wherein they say that if you eat camel meat it breaks your wudu. Is there any reasoning that you can think of for eating camel meat breaking your wudu? Apart from of course the Prophet Sallallahu telling us. What is the ta'leel? Is there an illa? Is there a reasoning? Imam Ibn Qayyim in his book Al-A'lam al muwaqa'in he said eating camel's meat he said, look, the camel, it has the attributes of the shayateen and the jinn. In fact, in one narration where the Prophet ﷺ said in Tirmidhi Nabi Dawood, he said, لا تصلوا في مبارك الإبل Don't pray in the places, the stable places of the camels. فإنها من الشياطين For verily they are from the devils. Meaning that they are created from the devils. They are like the devils. Okay? So based upon this hadith, Imam Ibn Qayyim, it says, he's saying it has the attributes of devils. So how do you uh, defeat uh, the shaitan? One of the ways is to make wudu, use of water. So likewise, if you were to eat camel meat, you have to make wudu. It breaks your wudu, okay? This is a ta'lil that he came with. The imam, he says as a last sentence, he says, وَمَنْ تَيَقَّنَا tahara, Whoever is sure of being in a state of purity, وَشَكَّ فِي الْحَدِثِ Then he has doubt, did he break his purity or not? Did he fall into a state of hadith? أَوْ تَيَقَّنَا الْحَدِثِ Or the opposite. He showed that he was a state in a state of doubt. ثُمَّ شَكَّ فِي tahara. Then he has doubt. Did I make tahara? Okay, so opposite to the first state. فَهُوَ عَلَامَ تَيَقَّنَا مِنْهَا So he remains upon that which he was certain about. Why? Because we said the rule many a time. اليقين لا يزول بالشق Certainty, a state of certainty is not removed by doubt. And the proof of that is the hadith in Bukhari Muslim of Abdullah ibn Zayd. Where he said, Shukia ila Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a rajul yukhaya lu ilayhi, and nahu yajid a shayfi salah, fakal la yan sarif hatta yasma a saut, a yajid a rih. A man, Abdullah bin Zayd in Bukhari Muslim, he said, A man came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and said, I find some difficulty in my stomach movement in the prayer. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Don't leave your prayer until you smell something, meaning you know that you've broken your wudu, or you hear something, meaning that you hear the sound of breaking wudu. So you don't leave us a state of certainty with doubt. Tayyib, wa sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And sorry, just before ending, one more thing to add, which wasn't mentioned here, that many of the scholars, the Hanbali scholars, they say that washing the dead body, the person who actually washes the dead body, touches it, his wudu is also broken. Not the one who's pouring the water, the one who's doing mubashara, the one who's touching the body, then his wudu is also broken. Tayyib.
Anything which was correct was from Allah Azza wa Jal. Any mistakes and shortcomings from myself and Shaitan. Yeah, I see what you're saying. You're, you're talking about the state of shak. Shak literally is that you have two possibilities equally. That's what shak is. If one of those possibilities takes over the other, then there's no more shak. It reverts to either, yes, I've broken wudu or I haven't. But if, if you're in an equal state, that I cannot determine, did I break wudu or did I not? That is what the ulama talk about when they mean shak. But if it went either, if it went beyond that, then no, you have to go and make your wudu. You don't have yaqeen anymore, nor are you in a state of shak. Okay? I hope that helps. Yeah, so, but my point, what I'm trying to avoid is we don't want people to be in a state of was was. This is what the ulama mentioned, these rules. Don't be in a state, did I have it? Did I not have it? That's why they say, look, if you're, if you're, if there's no certainty that you broke your wudu, go with the fact that you have wudu. Don't listen to your mind. Just go with it. The only, again, I mean, they, this is another rule. They said, if you've prayed the salah and you've moved from the salah, leave it. Don't even think about it. Just go with it. Because this is how shaitan starts whispering to us continually and we get that disease of what's worse.